So one thing I've been tracking very closely, I actually did a monologue here before the release, was the government is mandated to release all of the records related to JFK's assassination. And president after president has been pushing off this deadline. Uh, was Once again, that deadline was upon Joe Biden, and he did do a limited release of documents. So very excited to be joined by uh, an expert journalist and researcher on exactly what is revealed by these documents and also what is revealed by which documents are continuing to be withheld. Uh, we're joined by Jefferson Worley. He's a Washington journalist and author. He's co-founder and editor of the JFK Facts Substack, which I'm a subscriber to and you should be as well. He's also vice president of the Mary Farrell Foundation. Great to have you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. A lot to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So for people who are uninitiated, can you just give the backstory of where this release came from, what compelled action in the first place? So the assassination of President Kennedy 60 years ago has long been controversial, and Congress passed a law in 1992 in order to quell speculation and keep people fully informed that the government had to release all of its records related to the assassination and various investigations that were connected with it. In Congress, a lot, of, a lot was done. It was a good law. A lot of the material was released. But Congress said after 25 years, everything has to be released, except in the rarest of cases. That was the law. This is a law, by the way, that passed Congress unanimously. So the intent of Congress was very clear that after 25 years, and like you said, since then, since 2017, first President Trump and then President Biden have delayed enforcing the law to, you know, to its full extent. Um, and they've been giving a pass to various federal agencies, primarily the CIA, but also the FBI and other government agencies, which are still withholding portions of some files related to the assassination of President Kennedy. So last month, there was this big ballyhoo. The Biden White House released a memo, and the CIA did a big press offensive and tuned in their favorite reporters in Washington. And they said, look, we're, you know, we're releasing all this stuff. There's really nothing left here. It's very, it's all cut and dried, and we've complied with the law. And you know, when we went in to look at that, we at the Mary Farrell Foundation, which is JFK researchers, it was a very partial release. It was, there's still 4,000 CIA documents that contain redactions that are related to the assassination. So it, you know, it was kind of a shell game. And so now we're trying to figure out what's going to happen next. And what one striking thing that happened this time around was the press coverage, for once, was very skeptical. You know, I mean, even mainstream media organizations are now like wondering, like, the CIA must be hiding something if they're hiding all this stuff, you know? And no, 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 the CIA comes along and briefs their favorite reporters on background and says there's nothing to it. But, you know, that's not really very convincing anymore. So as we go into 2023, as we head to the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, the issue of, you know, will the CIA fully disclose is still a live one. Now they have till June 30th. So we'll see this spring whether they're going to be any more forthcoming or whether Biden can put his foot down and force them to fully disclose. That hasn't happened yet. And you and other researchers have identified certain documents that you're particularly interested in, which have not been released as of yet. What are some of the pieces that, in your view, are missing and could help fill in some of the important blanks here? Well, there's, there's sort of big picture things, and then there's very focused things. So let me, let me start with a big picture one. One of the documents that we wanted to see the most, um, uh, I think, uh, was a document that JFK's advisor, Arthur Schlesinger, wrote to him in June 1961. This is two years before the assassination. Um, it was uh, in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was a total failure. That was the CIA's plan to overthrow Fidel Castro. It was very embarrassing to President Kennedy that it failed within the first hundred days of his presidency. Um, and he was mighty pissed off at the CIA at that point, and the feelings were mutual. Um, you know, the CIA didn't like Kennedy because he hadn't backed their plan the way they thought he would. So in this period of confrontation between the CIA and the White House, Schlesinger writes a memo to, to JFK about CIA reorganization, and that's the title of the memo. And they're thinking about, well, maybe we should reorganize the CIA. So a very interesting memo. Um, of which about a page and a half are still redacted by the CIA. And we were hoping that this would be like, we'd finally see what's under there. And, and first of all, like there's no names of agents in there. You know, are, this is two years before the assassination. It doesn't have anything to do with the assassination directly. 
So why not declassify it? And you know what they did, Crystal? They declassified one sentence out of the page and a half. And the rest of it remains blank. So what do we draw That's from this? You know, example. the CIA doesn't want to talk about their conflict with President Kennedy 60 years ago. And somehow that's related to the assassination. That's kind of a common sense conclusion that you would draw from this. Right. And before so, you go into the, the yeah. micro piece, just to draw right. this out for people, you know, one sure. of the primary hypotheses here is that the CIA was somehow implicated in the assassination of JFK. Um, that's certainly something that I think a lot of of, uh, of research and a lot of the holes in the story points to. And what people who say, no, 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 that's not the case, will say is, well, JFK did a lot of the things that the CIA wanted him to do, so they really weren't at odds. Ultimately, he had sort of gone all on board with, you know, the uh, Red Scare and uh, was w kept a lot of the CIA heads in charge. So, you know, that's not really plausible because they didn't really have this conflict that other people see. And so that's why this memo is significant, okay. ultimately, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because that's that's one view. I would say I've written three books about the CIA in the 1960s, and particularly about three powerful men in the CIA. You know, the CIA and the White House were very alienated in 1963. The CIA and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were very alienated in 1963. And that's not Morley's conclusion. That's the conclusion of the official history of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And it's also seen in dozens of books by CIA people. Kennedy's liberal policies, especially on Cuba, were very disturbing to people in the CIA. Yes, Kennedy went along with, with the CIA on other things. He went along in Vietnam. But you know, if you know the story of the CIA, and especially Cuba operations, the sense of alienation after the Bay of Pigs was very deep on both sides. So that continued through 1963. And it raises the question of if the president was killed by his enemies, as a lot of people think, you know, who would have the capacity to make the crime look like something else, right? And it would be people like the CIA. That, now, I don't have a CIA done it theory. I don't know who killed Kennedy. Um, that's what we're looking for. We're looking to try and, you know, resolve. And so one of the things that we do as researchers is I look at three categories of people. Uh, if you're looking, if you're talking about suspects in the assassination, and that's people, CIA people who were involved in assassination operations, other assassination operations. Um, CIA people who implicated themselves in the crime at one point or another, and Howard Hunt and David Morales seem to do that at different times, um, and uh, um, people who knew about Lee Harvey Oswald before the assassination, okay? And so if you look at those people, and that's, what, that's where we're drilling down now, you know, first of all, one thing that people should know, and this is, there's a lot of debates and disputes about the assassination, but one thing I think everybody, all researchers would agree is, the CIA knew far, far more about Oswald than they ever told the Warren Commission or they ever told the American people. And, and that's what we're drilling down on now is, the CIA was very interested in Oswald, their denials notwithstanding. Um, wh why were they interested and what were they doing with him? What, you know, what did they want to do with him? And so what we believe, a lot of researchers, one very likely explanation is, Somebody was running an operation using Oswald. Now, was that an operation to kill the president? Don't know. Was it an operation that underestimated the threat that Oswald posed to the president? It, possibly. We don't know. But that's where the story's going. The CIA's interest in Oswald before the assassination. And uh, so talk to me then about the, the, the macro was the, the memo that laid out a potential restructuring of the CIA plan. What were the micro pieces that you were hoping would be in this release and were not? So we're interested in the CIA operations that touched on Oswald, that somehow he was involved with. And one of the most striking examples of that is happens three months before the assassination where Oswald has a series of encounters in New Orleans with a group called the Cuban Student Directory, which we now know was funded by the CIA. The CIA didn't disclose that to assassination investigators. And what this group did in that was they publicized Oswald's pro-Castro politics. And they made a big deal out of it. A totally obscure man. Nobody had ever heard of Lee Harvey Oswald, but they were paying close attention to him. And they were on the radio, they were on TV, they were in the newspaper. Oswald was a pro-Castro activist. Well, when Oswald was arrested, 
that same group went to the press and said Kennedy was killed by a communist. And so the whole first day coverage was very much shaped by the information from the Cuban Student Directorate, these people who had had some contact with Oswald, some fights over Cuban politics in New Orleans. That's what we want to know about. And these records are known to exist. Um, they're known to concern CIA operations. This isn't a fishing expedition. It's a very precise request. Um, you know, make these records public. And they didn't make them public. And in fact, they seem to deny that these were even JFK records. So they're digging their feet in because they really, really don't want to talk about this story. But it is starting to see the light of day. Um, your latest Substack piece, let's go ahead and put this up on the screen, guys. It says, the CIA's new spin on Lee Harvey Oswald, the official story of the so-called lone gunman, recently changed. Why? Um, so their original position that basically, like, oh, we didn't know anything about this dude. He just kind of came out of nowhere, has become increasingly untenable. And so they've had to make some rhetorical shifts uh, without really fully acknowledging the way that they lied in the past. And you break some of those down for us in the Substack piece. Just lay it down for us. Yeah, so, I mean, look, they don't call it the Central Intelligence Agency for nothing. These people are smart, okay? And they're defending their interests in a smart way. You know, but their problem is, is they don't really have a ready cover story for the records that we're, we're requesting. So they're trying to dodge what's going on. So like you said, it used to be when the Warren Commission came out, the CIA said, you know, we didn't know anything about this guy. I mean, he came out of nowhere. We just we just didn't know, you know, with revelations of congressional investigation in the 1970s and declassification, which started in the 1990s we finally saw that that just wasn't true at all. They knew a lot about Oswald. They had opened a file on him and monitored his movements constantly for four years. And we're not talking about like some lowly clerk at the CIA who's paying attention to, you know, losers and lone nuts department. These were top people in the agency, in the counterintelligence staff of, run by James Angleton and in the director of operations run by Dick Helm. So, these were the people who had information about Oswald before the assassination. So they never said that. And in the 1990s, that became clear. And so now, if, if they go to talk to reporters, they can't say, oh, we, we didn't know anything about this guy. So now they've backed up. And now they're just saying, we never engaged with him. So they're not denying that they knew all about it. They're not denying that they monitored him. They're just saying they never engaged him. Well, that's possible. So, you know, let's check it. Let's see the files. And if there's nothing there, there's nothing there. And they can exculpate it. They can exonerate themselves. That didn't happen either. So, you know, on the face of it, that seems suspicious, maybe. I mean, you know, we didn't get a very good explanation, except for these talking points that they distributed to their favorite reporters. And in there, you know, they said that the, the records that we're seeking, the, the, the file of George Joannides, they denied that they had withheld that from investigators. And, and that's false. They did deny it from investigators. And, 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 and Judge Tonheim, the head of the Assassination Records Review Board, said as much in a letter to Biden last month. So, you know, the judge put it on the table. These are JFK records. The CIA needs to put them out, review them, and release them. And they didn't do that. So it's a very clear case. And we now have a, another, you know, another deadline. Will they blow it again? You know, after you blow the deadline four times, you can probably count on blowing it five times, right? Yeah, in, fair in, enough. A Washington bureaucracy would, 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 you know, conclude that. So that's where we're at right now. Well, one thing that you do, as you pointed out, have on your side that you may not have had in the past is a more skeptical media. And what do you attribute that to? I mean, I think primarily that, that um, you know, the government story is not very credible. I mean, you can't say we're not hiding anything, but let us keep 4,000 documents secret. Now, you know, the counter argument that they say and that they're, you know, that their people in the in their public affairs office say is, you know, this there's nothing related to the assassination in these records. OK, but, you know, that's fine. The law says you have to release them all. So if you're right, release them. You know, their, their obstinance, their digging in tells you something. And it, it, that's all you can say. And we got to wait and see if we can if we can actually get the records. Yeah. You have an agency that has a proven track record of lying, insisting they never engaged with Lee Harvey Oswald. But the very documents that could prove them correct, 
they for some reason for some reason don't want to show the public. Um, the last thing that I want to get for you is why should people still care about this story? Why should people still be interested in this? Well, I, I think that it shows. I mean, it's a couple of things. One, you know, the notion that President Kennedy was killed by his enemies is kind of commonsensical, and a lot of people believed it. So it's not it's not crazy to think that that's what happened. Jackie Kennedy thought that's what happened. So, you know, we need to understand our history and what really happened, and you know, we need to hold the government accountable. You know, and there's two ways to look at the JFK story. One is, you know, let's use that to tear down the government. And you know, and 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 get rid of these people. But the other way to look at it is, you know, let's hold the government accountable and prove that the that, that the system can work and that we can admit our bad mistakes. And you know, if something untoward happened with President Kennedy, you know, the American people are mature and we've seen a lot. You know, we know that extra constitutional conspiracies are normal in American history, from Watergate to January sixth. We see extra constitutional conspiracies. If something like that happened in 1963. I think people will say, yeah, you know, we need to know that. So that's where we're at. That's why people should care about it today, because it's not just, you know, it's not just a, a question of something that happened long ago, but it's a test of government, of self-government today. That's think, why it matters today. I think, I think that's very well said. Um, tell people where they can find you. And also, I know you have a, a really exciting podcast coming out today. So let people know about that as well. Yeah, so if you're interested in the JFK story, um, subscribe to JFK Facts, um, jfkfacts.substack.com. You'll get a daily dose of JFK news. Um, you can sign up for free or you can be a premium subscriber for the modest cost of $5 a month. So, and you will learn all about the JFK story. And, you know, frankly, we're ahead of the media now where we have the credibility now. And so major news organizations are at least listening to our take on what's going on. So if you want that news first, go to jfkfacts.substack.com. Uh, you can get in touch with me, DM at uh, Jefferson Morley on Twitter, um, and uh, you can follow me there. Uh, I tweet about you know, what's in the JFK news um, uh, you know, on a pretty, pretty regular basis. And one of the things that paying subscribers get um, with JFK Facts is access to the weekly podcast. And I have a terrific episode, which is going on tonight, with a man named Ernst Titovitz. And Ernst Titovitz was a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald um, in Russia. He's still alive, he's a biochemist. He was a 20 year old medical student. Oswald was a 20 year old ex-Marine and Titovitz spoke English and he got to know the man who has been accused of killing President Kennedy. And his view of the man of Oswald is quite interesting and quite different than anything you've probably ever heard before, certainly from mainstream news organizations. Um, a very interesting man. So if you want to hear that, um, tune in at uh, 8 o'clock tonight, jfkfacts.substack.com. Um, and uh, I think you will learn something. I thought I knew a lot, and I learned something. So. <laughs> Fantastic. That is a great <laughs> season. I will definitely check it out. Um, you guys all should as well. Jefferson Morley over at JF JFK Facts, uh, journalist, researcher, and really, really grateful for your time today. Thank you so much, sir. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just wanna give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.